All right. Um, let me just pray, and then we'll get started. So, Father God, I thank you for your presence with us today. Lord, I thank you that you are speaking to your bride, to your church. And, Father, we just come before you this morning with open ears, open hearts, and open eyes to what you are inviting us into. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, I want to begin this morning, which would be our first Sunday together corporately in 2024. I want to begin by resharing a prophetic word that Jenny Leeson shared last Sunday. And she shared it on the date of 12-31-23. Uh, and if you take that date and you take the dashes out of the date, um, the numbers become 1-2-3-1-2-3. One, two, three, one, two, three. And so I'm just going to read to you the word that Jenny shared with us. One, two, three, one, two, three, go. When you see it twice, pay attention. I just saw a prophetic word that says in 2023, the enemy wore the people of God out. We are tired. But in the next three days, and the Lord gave this word to Jenny on December 29th, but in the next three days, God will refire up his people and in 2024, we will exhaust the devil. One, two, three, go. Hitting the ground running in 2024. Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, those that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. 2023 was the waiting on the Lord. I know I have felt like I was waiting all year for the power of God to hit, waiting for healing, waiting for promises that had not been fulfilled, etc. 2024 will be a year of soaring above it all, that in our soaring and growing dependency on God, frustrating the devil, we will outrun the devil as we hit the ground running, and God's going to give us a supernatural strength and perseverance. Anybody agree with that? Say amen, right? It's a good word. Um, when Jenny shared that word, it, it got me really excited because it, it was confirmation to what the Lord had been speaking to me and to others, um, and it really goes back uh, to 2020. Y'all remember 2020? I tell you, we were so excited, excited the first Sunday of 2020 um, because there were so many prophetic words regarding God giving us a 2020 vision that God would make clear what his desires for his people, for his kingdom, and for this world would be. Well, he did give us 2020 vision, but just like seeing in hindsight 2020, uh, it's often after we've gone through the situation that we see so clearly. And what, what we saw is that even though we believed we lived from the kingdom of God prior to 2020, as the church... We really didn't. And it wasn't until we experienced the hardship of the pandemic, everyone experienced it, that we recognized that the Lord wanted to teach us, reveal in us, how to walk above the circumstances that are happening around us. It is that exactly what Richard talked about, living from heaven, bringing heaven to earth. And it isn't until everything gets extremely uncomfortable that we realize we may just be simply living a comfortable North American life <laughs> rather than truly living from the kingdom of earth, kingdom of God to earth. So that's where we were in 2020. And I have watched from 2020 to 21 to 22 to 23 that the Lord is, again, teaching his church to live from heaven to earth, releasing the kingdom of God to everyone around us. That means everything that Jesus is, his peace, his truth, his grace, his presence. And so I'm excited because I feel like the Lord has been raising us up, teaching us how to live from that vantage point. And what I'm hearing prophetically in 2024 is that we get to shoot out now in all the work that the Lord has been doing in our hearts and through our hearts. So again, one, two, three, one, two, three, and the whole church said, 
Okay, all right. That's what we're stepping into for 2024. That being said, um, we are stepping into tomorrow into a 21-day fast. Now, if you are interested in participating in this fast, there are printed off um, hard copies of all the different days out in the lobby, or you can go to our website or the app and look at those digitally. What I'm asking is that each person, if you feel led to do the 21-day fast, ask the Lord what to fast. It could be food, it could be TV, it could be Facebook, it could be YouTube, it could be coffee, it could be chocolate, it could be candy, it could be a a whole different myriad of things. But to ask the Lord what he would have you fast in that. Um, And um, as I've been thinking about the fast and as I've been hearing from different people what the Lord is speaking to them regarding the fast. And let me just say this. Like, it's interesting. The Lord often gives us something to fast that's directly connected to the freedom he wants to impart in each one of us. So if you have the thought, ooh, I should fast that, but that would be really, really hard, that's probably the thing you need to fast. (laughs) If your friend says, I'm going to fast this, and you go, ooh, that'd be easy, I'm going to do that, that's probably not the thing that you are to fast, okay? Okay. So really hear from the Lord in regards to what that will look like for you. So um, as I've been thinking about this fast, I have incredible anticipation that God is not only going to do a good work in me, but he's going to do a good work in every person that participates in the fast. And as I've been thinking about that, um, I've been thinking, man, Lord, I know you're going to show up, but I don't exactly know how you're going to show up. And as I was thinking about that aspect of it, I just felt like the Lord directed me to the scriptures and and this this sense that I may not know exactly or I may not be able to anticipate directly how the Lord is going to show up, but there are numerous examples, numerous stories, numerous testimonies within scripture of what the Lord did in the midst of that person's fast. And so, again, it's not a formula. If you do this, this will happen. But I do believe that we are taking a moment this morning where we're like in the um, locker room and we're getting ready to go out and play the game out on the, on the what's it called? Field. There you go. I'm not a very good sports person. We're in the locker room and we're getting ready to go out on the field. And this is a fasting pep talk. If God is calling you into fasting, I believe we can step in tomorrow, into tomorrow with an anticipation that he is going to do good things. And what I share this morning, he may do in you, he may do something else. But I want us to carry these um, stories, these testimonies into our next 21 days because I guarantee you if you say yes to this, you're going to bump into a day where you forget and mess up your fast, where you think it doesn't matter, where you think um, this is too hard and I don't want to do it, where you fall, what what I like to call, where you fall off the fasting wagon. And um, I just believe the Lord's going to give us keys in Scripture, encouragement in Scripture to stay on the fasting journey. And let me just say one more thing. Does everyone remember the word perfection in Scripture? The Hebrew understanding of perfection does not mean 100% right. It means completion. So if you do a 21-day fast and just two of those days, even one of those days is the only day you're able to do that fast, but you were in the long haul with Jesus, there's perfection in that because you gave the Lord a place to do a work in your life. So we're going to look at four places in Scripture, and again, we're just going to glean from the text of what we can anticipate during the next 21 days of prayer and fasting. And so first, I want to look at Esther 4, and we're going to look specifically at verses 14 through 17, but I want to give you a little context before we jump into the passage. Um, This is where Mordecai has found out that Haman has promised to pay into the king's treasury um, if the Jews are destroyed. 
And so Mordecai, which is Esther's cousin, and Esther is a queen in the castle, Mordecai communicates through the maids, through the eunuchs, to Esther that not only um, has Amen, Haman um, promised to pay into the king's treasury, but that he has written a decree for their destruction. And so uh, Mordecai is communicating with Esther, and he asks Esther to go before the king, and we see in verse 8, and plead before him for her people, for the Jewish people. Um, At this point, Esther communicates back, and she communicates a really valid point. If I go before the king uninvited, I will more than likely be killed. And so Esther, even though she hears that her people, the Jewish people, are in trouble, her fear of being killed is keeping her from going before the king. And this is what um, Mordecai says in response to that. He says, for if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Can you please say, such a time as this? Okay, verse 15. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, day and night. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. And so again, we see in this passage, Esther, as she is afraid to speak to the king on behalf of her people, in that moment of fear, she recognizes the importance of fasting, in order to do the very thing that God has called her to do, not only on behalf of herself, but on behalf of her people, the Jewish people. So looking at this text in Esther, what can we anticipate as we pray and fast in the next 21 days? I believe that we can anticipate that God will prepare for us such a time as this moment. Esther was stepping into unknown territory where God was calling her into her such a time as this moment. And that required her stepping past her fear, her very legitimate fear, into what seemed impossible, deliverance for her people, the Jewish people. She prepared herself for what God was calling her into through not only fasting herself, but also partnering with her cousin, her family, partnering with her maids, those persons closest to her, and with her people, the Jewish people that were in that province. God may have something, I believe, on the horizon for you to step into, for me to step into, for our church to step into. He may have something on the horizon that seems scary and impossible. But I believe as we spend time fasting and praying, I believe God will speak to you. He will speak to me. He will speak to us specifically in how to move forward. And as we fast and pray about those for such a time as this moment, I believe God will lead us with his favor And his protection, just as he did with Esther, where we see that the very evil scheme of Haman, the thing that he meant for his enemies, the Jewish people, that evil scheme actually came back upon himself. We see that in Esther 7.10. It says, so they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. What happened to Israel's uh, enemy uh, Haman in the Old Testament is also true for our enemy, the devil, today. Every scheme our enemy puts against us has the very beautiful potential of backfiring on him, on the enemy. 
through God's redeeming presence and plans. It goes back to that prophetic word that Jenny gave, one, two, three, one, two, three, go, that in 2024, the people of God will exhaust the devil. Instead of the devil exhausting the people of God, the people of God will exhaust the devil. All right, I'm going to look at the next place in Scripture, Exodus 34, 27 through 28. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write these words, for according to the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So in this portion of Scripture, we see that Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights with Father God. And he removed himself from all distractions, and he abstained from food and water. And during this time with the Lord, God spoke to Moses, and God also spoke through Moses as Moses wrote down the Ten Commandments. Now, gleaning from the text, what I am not saying is that if we fast and pray, we can anticipate writing portions of the Bible. Okay, not saying that. What I do see through this passion, through this, um, this portion of Scripture is that there is a connection between Moses spending time with God, removing himself from daily distractions, and fasting from comforts like food and water. God not only spoke to him, but God also spoke through him. Again, for us as uh, the body of Christ, I believe God speaks to his people. Does everybody believe that? Amen? But often what keeps us from hearing him is not that he is not speaking, but actually that we are not hearing. Distractions in our life, as well as often our creature comforts, can keep us from hearing what God is speaking. But often when we remove those distractions and creature comforts, we are able to hear what the Lord is speaking, what he has always been speaking. And we not only hear for ourselves, but we are also able to hear from others. So the second thing I see in the text in in looking at what we can anticipate as we pray and fast for the next 21 days I believe we can anticipate an increase in the clarity in discerning God's voice. God is speaking, and God desires for us to discern his voice, to hear his voice. And as we discern what he is speaking, as we hear what he is speaking, I think it goes back to that prophetic word that Jenny gave again. One, two, three, one, two, three, go. This is a soaring with God, dependency with God, running with God. See, if we aren't discerning and hearing what the Lord is speaking, often we don't know how to follow him or we may not realize we are with him. So it's so key for the body of Christ to hear and discern his voice. Um, You know, I discovered a number of years ago that one of the ways that um, is really good for me to fast is running, like jogging. And I'm not a good runner. I don't particularly care for running. But I've gone about, oh, probably two months of not running, maybe longer than that, of not running at McDowell Creek on Fridays. And when we run at McDowell Creek, we run a trail, and we go up and down stairs. And so if we do it twice, it's about four and a half miles, but it's like 70-some flights of stairs. And it is hard. It is not easy. And, you know, it's cold outside. You don't really want to go. It's raining. Uh, Starbucks sounds better. Like, we have a lot of excuses, or at least I do. But I, I went again on Friday, and I was reminded of why the, the fast of running is such a gift to me. You know, by Friday, I typically have my message prepared. I'm all done with that. And every Friday as I run... The message that I've already prepared, the Lord preaches it to me. And the words that he has given me, they come to life inside of me. It is the wildest, craziest thing. And when I got done on Friday, I thought to myself, I cannot miss a Friday. Because often when the Lord gives me a message to share, there... um, 
And it's the same with the Word of God. How many of you have ever read the same portion of Scripture twice, but it isn't read by you the same both times? Meaning that you look at it and go, I never saw that before. There's that place of deeper revelation. There is something about running for me that just like beats the snot out of me, I think, where I hear clearer than I'm able to hear during the week. And it is a gift to me. That is the the gift of fasting. There is a clarity around the Lord's voice because, again, he is always speaking But the distractions of life or the creature comforts of life, they often can keep us from discerning what he is speaking. All right, next I want to move to Joel 2, verses 12 through 13. It says, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. All right, so in this uh, portion of Scripture, Israel had walked away from following God. And God was calling them back um, to turn back to him. It was a call to repentance. And part of that repentance included fasting. Again, if you look at the scripture, it says, turn to me with all your heart with fasting. I believe there is a powerful connection between fasting and repentance. Now, if you are unaware, the New Testament idea of even the Old Testament repentance is turning away, turning back, turning back towards God. So when we repent, it's not that we feel really bad about ourselves. When we repent, it's that we're turning back to God. Um, as I was looking at this passage, I was reminded a, a couple of years, or a number of years ago now, um, the Lord had spoke to both my husband and myself, um, to Sean and I separately, about tithing off of the, the gross of our business income. Now, financially, um, that was impossible, okay? We, were in, we are still in agriculture, and that was absolutely impossible, but we both heard the Lord separately. So we took that as confirmation and began to tithe off of the gross of our business income. And as we did that, we ran out of money pretty quickly. (laughs) So as we ran out of money, we needed to have more money to pay our bills. And so we started to look around and go, okay, Lord, what do we do? And we felt like the Lord said, you need to sell your equipment. Well, that seems pretty crazy for a farm to sell their equipment, but that's what we did. And so with every piece of equipment we sold, again, we would tithe off the, um, the selling of each piece of those equipments. Now, I don't have the time this morning to go into the, the bigger testimony of what the Lord did during that time, but in a nugget, what the Lord actually was leading Sean and I in was a financial fast. We thought we were fasting for other reasons, but really what the Lord was doing was leading us in a financial fast because we not only were running out of money, but we had to learn to spend money differently. And as we learned to spend money differently and didn't have the money to pay for the things that we needed, yet saw God show up, what happened is the Lord began to do a work in our hearts. Now, let me read this again. At Joel 2.12, it says, Turn to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So as we stepped into this financial fast, it began to look like repentance because we recognized ways that we were spending money in the past that was not good stewardship of what the Lord had given us. We began to recognize in our past where we had used money to try to make ourselves happy. We recognized in our past where we actually allowed money to be our God because money determined how we made our decisions instead of allowing God to help lead us in making the decisions that he was calling us to. So again, we stepped into a financial fast 
Joel 2.12, again, turn to me with all your heart with fasting, with weeping, and mourning. Now, the weeping and mourning, again, that we experienced was this gift of repentance where we recognized things that we absolutely could not see about our own finances. But when we fasted in our finances, all of the sudden, our eyes were open and it became crystal clear how to make choices differently based on what the Lord had done in our heart. In Joel, it says, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. In this passage, as well as in my personal life, I I see this connection between fasting and the revealing of our hearts. And a connection between the revealing of our hearts that leads to repentance. Fasting leads to repentance. Repentance leads to deliverance. And deliverance leads to great joy as we experience the graciousness and merciful nature of God in our lives. Again, we experienced weeping and mourning and that act of fasting. But that weeping and mourning led to a, us to deliverance. And when we stepped into that place of deliverance where the Lord was shifting our mindsets, we were met by the very incredible nature of God. That portion of scripture, again, ends with, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Through our financial fast, we saw the ways we lived our lives that were turned away from God. And we saw the ways we lived our lives that turned away from God's best for us. Again, we were blind to those ways. But that financial fast opened our spiritual eyes. And as we repented and returned to the Lord in those areas of our finances, we experienced God's incredible grace and mercy. What we experienced was not punishment. I just want to say that. It was not punishment, even though it may have felt like punishment at first. What we experienced from God was his incredible kindness as he freed us from old ways of thinking regarding our finances. So again, this question, what can we anticipate as we pray and fast in the next 21 days? The Lord may be asking you to fast in some specific way with finances. He may be asking you to fast with food, not eat fast food, but fast with food. He may be asking you to fast um, social media, um, candy, chocolate, coffee, chai tea, whatever that looks like. And I believe that when we say yes to that fast, that we can anticipate that he is going to reveal some things in our hearts. And through that revealing, we are going to experience repentance, which leads to deliverance, which always leads to great joy in God's graciousness, mercy, and kindness. How many here today are sensing that the Lord is asking you to fast a specific thing and it feels difficult or hard to you? Raise your hand right now. Okay. Keep your hand up. I just felt this at at the 9 a.m. and I feel this again right now that we're just going to surrender this to the Lord. Because this isn't about grinning and burying it or it isn't about pulling our boots up by our bootstraps. This is simply about partnering with the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your spirit. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would pour out your grace upon us. And we thank you, God, that you give us everything we need to do exactly what you are calling us into. And so we receive your guidance, Lord, and we receive your grace for that guidance, Lord. In your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going to finish up in the next five minutes. I want to finish looking at Luke 4. Um, And for the passage in Luke 4, what it really is, is the Lord gave me a prophetic word 
um, as I was reflecting on the passage. But before I share that prophetic word, I just want to share um, the context of it. And, sh- and if, if you remember, Luke 4 is that place in Scripture where Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. And the enemy, the Satan, comes and gives him three temptations. And we want to look at how Jesus responded to those temptations. But then I believe the Lord has a prophetic word for us in the midst of that story. Uh, So first of all, let me just begin in verse 1. It says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil, And in those days, he ate nothing, and afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. Okay, so right here, Jesus has just been water baptized by John, and then after he comes up out of the water, the next passage shows that he is led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, and he has 40 days and 40 nights of abstaining from all food. The enemy comes to him during those 40 days and 40 nights and and gives him three temptations, Now, for the first time ever, as I looked at this passage, I paused and I had this thought, Lord, why those three temptations? Because the enemy could have come at Jesus with a thousand different temptations. But why did the enemy choose those three? Here's the three that he chose. The first temptation um, we see in verse 3, it says, And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. That's in verse 3. And, and Jesus gives the answer. I'm going to read it again in a moment, but let me just read it to you now so we have the full context. Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So that first temptation, the devil suggests provision outside of the word of God. He's suggesting eating bread, which seems like a good idea. But Jesus knows exactly the temptation that the enemy is throwing at him, and his response shows us that it's not just about eating bread. It's about getting our sustenance from someplace other than the word of God. That's the first temptation. Here's the second temptation, verses 6 through 7. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. So this this second temptation, the devil promises to give Jesus all authority, but only to give him all authority if he would worship him. So again, the second temptation is about Jesus not worshiping Father God, but worshiping Satan. And here's the third temptation, uh, verse 9. It says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. The devil finishes with a temptation that challenges The identity of Jesus. He says, if you are the son of God. The enemy is tempting him with, challenging him with this idea of, is this truly your identity? Are you truly the son of God? So again, the devil, he chooses three specific temptations. He suggests provision and dependence outside of the word of God. He suggests Jesus, Jesus worshiping Satan instead of God. And he challenges Jesus' identity as the son of God. Now, before we go into the prophetic utterance, I just want to read quickly how the Lord Jesus responded to each one of those temptations with God's truth, God's word. In verse Four, he responds to this idea that we, he would receive his sustenance outside of the word. Jesus answered to him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The second response to the second temptation in verse 8, this is out of the temptation to worship the enemy rather than God. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. And then for the third temptation, Jesus' response in regards to the enemy challenging his identity, Jesus says, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So again, we look at this passage that Jesus fasted 40 days. We see that the enemy comes to tempt Jesus, that Jesus counters the enemy with the truth of God's word. But again, I go back to that question, why? Why did the enemy... Use these 
three specific temptations. And as I was meditating on the why, the enemy would pick all of these three, all of a sudden it became crystal clear to me. In the enemy's attempt to cut Jesus off from the word, from his worship and his identity, what the enemy did unknowingly was to provide a place in Scripture for the Lord to release a prophetic promise. And this is what I heard the Lord say. Nicole, as you fast, and I'm going to also give this to you, Valley Christian Center, as you fast, you will experience the Word of God like you never have before. The Word will come to life in you, and the Word will come to life to you in ways that you have never experienced before. When we fast in the next 21 days, we are going to see things in Scripture we have never seen before. Not because we're adding to Scripture, but what's going to happen is there's going to be a deeper revelation, an application to our lives that's going to bring transformation to our thinking, and it's going to catapult us into what God is calling us into. Here's the second temptation. Nicole, as you fast, Valley Christian Center, as you fast, you will recognize false areas of worship in your life. And as your eyes are open to the things you are currently worshiping, you will repent and turn, and you will turn to worshiping God. And the Lord said that we will worship him extravagantly, taking us to a deeper place in his presence. Again, as we step into this 21 days of fasting, I believe the Lord is going to bring a clarity where we recognize there are things in our lives that we are unknowingly worshiping, that we are unknowingly putting above what the Lord is speaking to us. And he's going to show us those things, and we're going to lay those things down. And as we lay those things down, our worship to him is going to begin to be experienced different in us. Imagine a rope completely around your body all the way down to where your hands and your feet are bound tight. Okay, can you imagine that? Now try to worship completely bound up like that. The Lord hears our worship and he loves our worship. But it's as he begins to cut those things that are binding us that we get to experience our worship of Jesus so very differently. I love to watch Michelle worship. Anybody else love to watch Michelle worship? It is amazing because I, I know that her worship is in the freedom that she has experienced and continues to experience in Jesus. So again, it's not about performance. It's not about doing things right. It's not even about moving a lot or not moving at all because my husband, he likes to stand really still and I like to move around. It's not about that. It's an internal spirit to Holy Spirit connection. Do we feel bound up? Do we feel not good enough? Do we feel like we don't deserve the Father's love? That is a bound up act of worship. Or do we feel free? Do we receive all that Jesus has paid for on our behalf? And do we worship him in that freedom that he's provided for us? So that's the second temptation. And here's the third one. I heard the Lord say, Nicole, as you fast, Valley Christian Center, as you fast, your identity in me, who I have created you to be, will be strengthened. And your perception of how you see yourself and others will be heightened. He used the word heightened. And partnered in a greater way with my perception of how I see you and others. Again, it's a shift in our elevation, a shift in our perspective. Where we are seeing things from the vantage point of the kingdom of God. So what can we anticipate as we pray and fast the next 21 days? Looking at this portion of scripture, scripture in Luke, prophetically, um, we can say that the word of life will come to life, or the word of God will come to life for us. 
that our worship of God will move into a deeper place of experience for us, that our identity will be fine-tuned in who he has created us to be. So would you please stand? Again, I have great anticipation in all that God is going to do in the body of Christ during the next 21 days. There are just too many movements of God that are deciding to fast specifically during this month of January. So I believe God is up to something big. And I believe he will do for some of us, maybe all of us, what he has highlighted in Scripture today. But I think that is only a drop in the bucket of what the Lord wants to do through this next 21 days of fasting and prayer. Um, But again... What I want us to do is if we come up against a hard spot in the next 21 days, we can go back to the Word of God and we can see how fasting launched Esther into the, for such a time as this moment, and we can remember, okay, Lord, if it's true for Esther, it's true for me. We can recognize, okay, if I stick with this fast, I can be like Moses, where I took every distraction and I set it aside and spent time with God. And because of what Moses experienced in Scripture, I can take that testimony for myself and I can believe and trust, Lord, that I am going to discern your voice in a new way, that your voice is going to be clearer to me. Um, We can look at the place uh, in Joel where Israel is called back to God. And so we can recognize that if we choose to fast, there may be a place in our lives where the Lord is inviting us into repentance. But we don't have to weep and mourn for too long because we can step into his joy because his nature, who he is, his mercy, his grace, we are going to encounter him as we repent and turn from our ways and turn our face to following God. And then finally, we just look at the example of Jesus and how he responded Um, with the word, with truth against every one of the enemy's temptations. But we also can see that because of the truth of the word of God, that we can experience everything that Jesus is speaking to us. We can experience a deeper place of connection with him. We can experience clarity in the word. And we can experience a greater identity, who we are, clarity in our identity. And so, Lord, I just want to thank you today for the gift of fasting. (laughs) Lord, thank you that the gift is not about punishment. It's not even about doing everything right. That this gift is really about us connecting in a greater way to you. That you bring great clarity through fast. That you bring repentance through fast. That you bring freedom through fast. And so, Lord, we surrender our lives to you, Lord, and we invite you to speak to us individually and corporately as the body of Christ. We thank you, Jesus, and in your name, amen. Amen. Okay, there will be a gathering group up here this morning to pray for you. If anyone wants to come up and receive prayer, bless you and have a wonderful day. Please do some Christmas free shopping on your way out the door um, and have a wonderful week.